The corridor is long, lit only by the occasional torch sitting on a sconce. Your footsteps echo on the cobblestone floor, disappearing into the darkness ahead. You've been in these ruins for hours, ever since that old witch told you about them. The home of an ancient wizard who dug deep into the earth in search of immortality, she said. Who knows what mystical treasures lie below? Another rat scurries by your feet, and the smell of rotting flesh suddenly permeates the air. Undead are close at hand, around the next corner maybe. You ready your longsword, acutely aware that its reach could be just as much a hindrance as a boon in tight quarters. But if you and your friends can survive this fight, and the next one, then untold rewards will be waiting for you. Just at the end of this dungeon. At least, that's how I imagine it going. Hi, I'm Ian from Incendium D&D. In today's video, we're going to talk about the classic dungeon crawl, and how you can make it just as fun online as at the table. I was introduced to Dungeons & Dragons by watching an actual play by Rooster Teeth back in 2016. It wasn't a very serious campaign. There were a lot of jokes and witty dialogue, but it did show me the basics of the game. The DM describes the scene, the players say how they react, and dice are rolled to determine the outcome. When I saw the players place their tokens on the map for the first time, my interest was piqued. It was mainly for combat, but there were times when social interaction or exploration used the map as well. Then they started running Tomb of Horrors, and that's when things got really interesting. Everyone was having a good time, laughing at the traps and puzzles, no matter how hard they were to figure out or survive. And I realized that a lot of fun could be had dungeon crawling, even though a lot has changed since Gary Gygax first started running his games. Everything I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is regarding my experience both at the table and online using Roll20. Ironically, no one's ever really explained to me how you're supposed to run a dungeon crawl. But although I don't think I'm very skilled at them, I've never gotten one to work off of the table, I think there are a few things I have to say on the subject. Things which might help you run your own dungeon crawl online, which is honestly the only way I play these days. So, But before I start breaking down what I've learned, let's give a little bit of context and define some terms. A dungeon crawl is, as defined by Wikipedia, yeah, I know, but this one's half decent, trust me. A type of scenario in fantasy role-playing games in which heroes navigate a labyrinth environment, a quote-unquote dungeon, battling various monsters, avoiding traps, solving puzzles, and looting any treasures they may find. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a large cultural shift in the game of Dungeons & Dragons. Originally, dungeon crawls put responsibility in the hands of the players in order to complete them. It was up to them to ask the right questions, look for clues, and be smart about the choices that they made. The dungeon master was an arbitrator, representing the neutral, cold nature of the dungeon itself. It didn't care whether or not you had a massive backstory with lots of plot development over the campaign, it was basically trying to kill you, or at least stop you from completing the dungeon. During this time, a DM did not simply give answers to the players. On top of that, clearing the dungeon meant rewards, XP, loot, gold, not just story-based MacGuffins. And that was incentive enough for any player to undertake a dungeon they encountered in the game world. But today the game has changed from being a simulationist experience to a more cooperative storytelling experience. Gameplay is more narrative. This is something that we talk a little bit about a previous video that we uploaded, narrative versus simulation. Of course, you can go check it out for more details, but I'll give you a brief rundown. I'm a narrative-focused dungeon master. That means that I'm more interested in creating a compelling story with my players at the table, where the drama is the focus of the game. That also means that I'm less interested in what the dice have to say about random outcomes of events. Having a factor of chance is good for the game, but if it interrupts the flow of the story or deflates the tension that I'm looking for, then I probably won't call for a role. Some of you might be more of a simulationist kind of dungeon master. This is where you're trying to create an experience which replicates the danger and randomness of real life. Like I said earlier, the dungeon doesn't care about your party's goals or backstory. 
The dungeon is just the dungeon, and it's gonna try to kill you no matter what. Players have to figure out how to survive it. This is a spectrum, of course. You can be a dungeon master that uses elements from both of these mindsets, and both are equally valuable. But because I'm interested in creating an exciting, compelling story at the table, my dungeon crawls are definitely gonna be narrative focused. With that out of the way, let's talk about setting up the game. The first thing you need to do is figure out if this is gonna be a narrative or simulationist experience. A lot of content creators have already talked about how to create the actual dungeon for your players to explore. But I find if you start with this in mind, you'll find it easier to return to the themes of the dungeon over and over as you're creating it. If you wanna focus on the narrative, let's start by creating a handful of rooms for your dungeon. Let's use the rule of three. Three big rooms connected by corridors and hidden passageways. Clearing a dungeon takes time, and the more rooms you have, the longer the players will spend exploring and completing those areas. As a narrative DM, you wanna give the players space to talk to each other, interact with NPCs, and search for clues but without bogging down gameplay. If you treat it as a series of scenes where the actions of one scene impact the next, you'll create a much more immersive experience. Of course, if you wanna run this as a simulation, we have to take the rule of three to the next level. I'm taking this page straight out of Matt Colville's book here. If you want a really detailed explanation of how this will all work, you can go check out his Running the Game series on YouTube. The simulationist dungeon will take the longest time to explore. It may even take multiple sessions to complete. It's got three levels, three areas per level, and three rooms per area. Doing the math, you get 27 rooms. That is a lot to prepare for a single session. Fortunately, you don't have to prepare it all at once. Take a few of them at a time, maybe one area of the first level. Your players will spend a lot of time during the session trying to navigate it and be careful about their decisions. This will slow down the gameplay enough for you to get the next level of the dungeon ready. If you play weekly, that's weeks of content. If you play monthly, that's months of content. So be careful how many rooms you actually put into the dungeon. 27 is a rule of thumb, not a hard and fast rule. There's nothing wrong with Googling somebody else's map as well and filling in those rooms with your own ideas. Creating a map from scratch means having to learn other software that you might not have the time for. But once you have your dungeon planned out, it's time to bring it to the table. This is the advantage of virtual tabletops. You usually get a top-down experience, which means that everyone can see where their tokens are relative to everyone else's on the map. No more craning your neck over the table, you just look at the screen. And if you need more information, you can always zoom out. Here's a sample map from Icewind Dale. I'm gonna use this as my example for the rest of the video. Now that we've got it on the virtual tabletop, you'll need to decide how much you want your players to be able to see at a time. Roll20 is interesting because you have the option of dynamic lighting. If you choose to use this, make sure that you introduce your players to it in advance so that they know what to expect. I've seen it go very wrong where the DM leaves the default settings of dynamic lighting on and the players get really confused about its functionality, especially if the tokens don't even have vision yet. If you or your players don't feel comfortable using dynamic lighting, that's okay. You can just use the fog of war tool on the left here to reveal spaces as you want them. The way it works is this, one, you go to the cog wheel on the page and select dynamic lighting. Two, I recommend explorer mode as this represents your characters remembering where they've been even if it's not currently lit up. Three, create a few light sources with the torches icon here. Four, this is super important. Always give your tokens vision. This is done by selecting the dynamic lighting settings under the tokens cog wheel. Five, if the character has dark vision, you can select the night vision option. Otherwise, say they have a torch and make the token emit 20 feet of bright light and 20 feet of dim light. Six, the last thing you need to do is define the boundaries of the map. You can use the dynamic lighting drawing tool, as you can see here. Here's what it looks like when you've done all this. For the DM, you see everything. For the player character, this is what they'll see. And of course, you need to make sure that the token is linked 
to the player on roll 20. You can do this by going into the cogwheel settings and selecting a player from the list. It is absolutely critical that you set all of this up before you even start playing. If you find that you need to make adjustments during the game, it can really bog down gameplay and ruin the immersion for the players. Lastly, don't underestimate the power of still images. Tokens can only convey so much. You could have a still image of an NPC or a backdrop on the side of the map so that your players have something to wrap their heads around. Now, let's talk about how we run the game on Roll20. Whether you use dynamic lighting or fog of war, dungeon crawls require discipline from your players. It's very tempting to just move your token around the board and trigger any potential traps or events that the DM has set up for you. As a DM, it's important to be upfront with this, and it will make things flow a lot smoother. I've tried doing this a few different ways in the past. When I first started doing dungeon crawls online, I allowed my players to move up to their speed across the grid, and then explain to them what happened as they moved or when they got to their destination. I thought that this was a reasonable take on it, but it really slowed down gameplay and created almost like a turn order for the players, which made me start thinking that I should be treating it more like a board game rather than Dungeons & Dragons. I've come up with a much better way since then, and of course, a lot of it is inspired by what I've heard from other content creators. Start by explaining the room they come to. List a handful of bullet points that give your players an idea of what they're looking at, and then let your players enter the room. You can have them place their tokens wherever they will, but let them know that they can't move from that spot until you resolve their actions. In other words, they lock in their token's location, tell you what they want to investigate, learn, or look for, and then you tell them what they find based on skill checks or passive ability scores. So basically, move the token, state your action, and then we'll resolve it. A lot less clunky than how I was running it before. Next, let's use a timer. It doesn't have to be a real stopwatch or hourglass or anything that would put pressure on the players to move around, but creating a sense of urgency will enhance the experience of the dungeon crawl. You just want to keep track of time as the heroes are delving through their dungeon. Here's an idea from Dungeon Masterpiece on YouTube. I highly recommend checking him out. He's a really charismatic guy and has this cool setup. Use a D6 counting up from one to six. Each number represents about 10 minutes of the players fiddling around or doing something significant that would further the story of the dungeon crawl. I really like this because you don't have to hide it from the players either. Be transparent with them about how much time has passed. It can really enhance the drama. And lastly, there's combat. If you're running this as a simulation, there's probably gonna be a lot of combat in the dungeon. Try to break these up as much as possible so it doesn't feel like the game is dragging on infinitely. Use social interaction or exploration to give your players some breathing room. Remember, the dark is only intense as long as there's some source of light to compare it to. Lovely cheese. If you're doing this narratively, you're probably gonna have one or two combats before the big boss fight, which the previous combats have built up to. You wanna build it up and up until it leads to a critical moment where all the tension is resolved. There's one tip that I think could work to help out combat, but I haven't really tried it out much, and you guys can let me know what you think in the comments below. The idea is basically a passive initiative list. This is specifically for the dungeon. You roll the initiative in advance of entering the dungeon, and then whenever combat breaks out, the players don't have to roll initiative over and over and over again. You can just have the monster roll initiative and figure out where they fit in that order. Unless, of course, they have the element of surprise, in which case the players will not be able to really do much on the first round. So you might as well put them at the top of the round anyway. Also, if you weren't using dynamic lighting yet, do not turn it on for combat. Unless you have another map already set up with dynamic lighting and everything, which is a whole bunch more work to do, it's just not worth turning on dynamic lighting and creating all that confusion. And that's it. That's what I've got for you on dungeon crawling on a virtual tabletop like Roll20. Here's a bulleted list of what we talked about in this video. If you have experiences as a player or a DM, what do you think of dungeon crawls? 
Did you like my advice, or did I completely miss the mark? I want to become skilled at dungeon crawling even though I don't always use it for my games, so any tips are appreciated. If you like this video, let YouTube know. Hit like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. It all means a lot to us and helps us keep creating the content that we love to do for you guys. For all of you new subscribers out there, thank you so much. Your support is very much appreciated. Have an awesome day, everyone, and I'll catch you guys next time.